Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to Australia, good morning to America, good evening to Greece. I want to express my feelings to refer to the promotion of the Greek philosophy in English that deprives the deep knowledge of, of the spirit of the holy original of wisdom. The divine language is the correspondence of nature to the human mind. The thought comes first and then the speech, then the writing. That's why I urge all to learn the Greek language. And according to Tolstoy, everyone wants to change the world, but no one wants to change themselves. We continue our eighth lecture of Hellenic education with the three Tolstoy's questions. And right now I give the floor to Professor Mr. John Hadjopoulos. Thank you very much, uh, coordinator. Welcome to the Hellenic Education Lesson 8. The previous lessons are on YouTube in these uh, links listed here. Lesson 8, we are going to talk about astronomy because Hellenic education includes the study of the astronomy because we are part of the universe and must uh, concentrate our attention to such explorations instead of trying to destroy our planet. In the laboratory, we are going to practice internal and external balance. And uh, Heleni, Heleni has prepared three, the um, story, three questions by Tolstoy. Here is the summary of that uh, Heleni has uh, developed for us. Before we go to the stars, let's uh, start from the Earth, because the Earth is the location that we do all the observations. So the terrestrial or Earth coordinate system that uh, we find our locations, like Sigma, you see here, is defined by two parameters, the longitude, this green arc here, and the latitude, this yellow arc here. Okay. The longitude is measured from the meridian of the Greenwich, and the latitude is measured from the equator. II is the Earth equator, and uh, to the location we are right here. Now imagine that we expand this uh, sphere here, representing Earth, to a radius of infinite, and then we get to the celestial sphere. And let's uh, see how we define the celestial sphere. Assume that the Earth uh, does not move while all the celestial bodies revolve around the Earth in a predictable way, east, west. Essentially, we assume that the terrestrial reference system, together with the celestial bodies, is projected outwards into space together with uh, all celestial voids on, on, on the celestial sphere, with the center at the center of the Earth and the radius at infinity, as we said earlier. The axis of the Earth's rotation is projected to the celestial sphere north and south, celestial poles, PP. The Earth's equator, II, is projected to the celestial equator. The Greenwich Meridian is projected to the celestial prime meridian G. The celestial sphere with all celestial bodies on its surface rotates around the celestial axis TP uh, from east to west. Let me get my microphone.
before the GPS, we had to calculate our location on the Earth using uh, astronomical observations. And that was uh, developed the geodetic astronomy. Actually, I have taken so many courses on geodetic astronomy. I would say about four courses here in Greece and one in the United States. So we can calculate uh, ground coordinates, the, uh, the longitude, latitude, and azimuth. And uh, we use uh, two celestial coordinate systems the equatorial and the horizon coordinate system. In the celestial sphere, as we said, we assume that the Earth is not moving. It's just like the geocentric system. We do that because we have to find out the location of the celestial voids relative to the Earth. With this assumption, it is very easy to do it. And therefore, the celestial sphere moves from east to west, rotates around the celestial poles, as you can see here. And uh, the sun, however, all, and all the stars, etc., they move as the celestial sphere rotates from uh, east to the west. They rise from the east, they go to the west. The sun, though, does one more uh, movement. And uh, this is called the ecliptic, you see here, which is uh, the movement that the Earth does around the Sun. But because we say here the Earth is mo not moving, the Sun is moving. So in 24 hours, the celestial sphere makes one rotation around the uh, celestial polar axis. Uh, the Sun uh, in one year makes uh, uh, rotation through the ecliptic. The ecliptic cuts the celestial equator in two points, the vernal equinox or gamma point, and the autumnal equinox or gamma prime, you can see here. These two points are uh, fixed points on the celestial sphere. They do not move. Of course, they move uh, with the rotation of the celestial sphere, but they are fixed in this location. Also, the ecliptic, which is the rotation of the sun around in one year uh, around the celestial sphere, uh, has an angle with the, with the plane of the equator, 23 degrees, 27 minutes, you can see here. And the, lower, the lowest part of the ecliptic is the winter solstice, and the highest part is the summer solstice, you can see here. There are um, several things to consider now, parameters we use in the celestial sphere. First of all, any circle passing through the poles and the celestial void body is called the hour circle, circle of the celestial body, you can see here. And uh, the angle of the hour circle of the celestial body and uh, certain other, uh, uh, say, reference circles like the Greenwich hour circle, the local hour circle, and the gamma hour circle here, define these so-called hour angles. Our angles, they are measured clockwise, as you can see here. Also in the point, if you take the plumb line upwards, cuts the celestial sphere in the zenith point, and uh, uh, downwards to the nadir point. And each uh, location on the Earth has different zenith and nadir point. A circle uh, perpendicular to the rotation of the Earth axis is a parallel circle, as you can see here. Again, uh, we are going to talk about two coordinate systems in the celestial sphere. There are more like the ecliptic, the galactic, and the supergalactic system also. But uh, we are interested just in our solar system, and we use these two systems. 
The equatorial uh, reference system uh, defines any celestial body with two parameters, the our angle h of the star, which is the angle clockwise from the vernal of uh, the our circle of the vernal of equinox, and the right ascension, which is the same like our angle, but it's uh, measured counterclockwise from the vernal of equinox to the star. Of course, these two angles are about the same. Uh, the other angle, the second parameter, is the declination of the star, which is the angle from the celestial equator to the star. These two angles we can see here in this uh, figure. Okay, this is the north uh, celestial uh, pole, and this is the celestial equator, the blue uh, plane. And this is the right ascension. You see, right ascension is counterclockwise. The our angle is clockwise to the star is this one. Okay, this is the declination to the star. This right ascension and declination they are constant. They need some small corrections because of the problems the axis of rotation here of the celestial sphere has. We are going to talk about it, but uh, there are uh, tables that give us these corrections, and uh, therefore. Uh, any star can be defined by these two parameters, which are more than less constant. They are changed through the time is very small. The second coordinate system uh, uses the azimuth and the altitude. And you can see here, if we assume here is the observer and here is the plumb line through the observer, defines the zenith and nadir point down here. Then uh, if we have a star, the arc above the horizon, the horizon is uh, plane perpendicular to the vertical line, okay, is the horizon. The arc over the horizon to the star here is the altitude of the star. Usually in our measurements, if we use a theodolite, we measure the altitude of the star and the time. And that, uh, that's how we can uh, do some calculators, cal calculations later on. Also, we have here the azimuth measured from north to the uh, vertical circle. Any circle passing through the zenith, nadir, and the celestial void body is called a vertical circle. Okay, so, so from the north to the vertical circle, we have the azimuth clockwise. Okay. Also here, uh, this circle you see here is the prime vertical. Prime vertical is the circle that has the zenith and the no uh, north and south celestial poles. So somewhere on this circle here, to this one, is the uh, north and south poles. It's, it's called the prime vertical. Where the prime vertical cuts the uh, horizon, okay, defines the four points of the horizon, like east, west, you see here, and north, south, right here. Here is some, uh, I summarize the two coordinate systems, horizontal and equatorial. Now let's go into our planet system. Our planet system, you see the sun at the center of the Mercury, Venus, and the planets around the sun. Uh, the way we, the distances from the sun now follow the golden number five, you see here 1.618. And if we assume that Mercury, the distance from Mercury to the sun is one, then the distance from Venus to the sun is one multiplied by five by this number, uh, the earth by five square and so forth. We must uh, say that uh, the fifth uh, orbit here was a planet that probably was exploded, exploded and uh, we have the asteroids there. Also we may see the comets 
And this is our solar system. There are a couple of laws uh, regarding the orbits of the planets around the sun. And uh, here are the Newton laws. And I'm going to uh, focus on the gravity, which is uh, inverse, pro inverse proportional to the square of the distance between two uh, masses, M1 and M2, you can see here and also the acceleration and the reaction force. Okay, in every force, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. Then we have the Kepler's law, the laws that um, the orbits of the planets are ellipses with the sun at one focus of the ellipse, you can see here. And you have to understand also the orbits in equal time, they write equal areas. And to do so, they have to move faster when they are close to the sun and slower when they are away from the sun. Of course, it is obvious that when they are close to the sun, the uh, attraction forces because of the gravity, they are higher. So they have to move faster in order to balance with the centrifugal force, the gravity force, okay? And that uh, is done with the Kepler's law of equal areas. Let's take a look also at the zodial circle that uh, the Earth uh, is uh, been around the sun, been in several locations. For instance, on May 21, the sun is projected to this asterism here, which is ta the Taurus. Okay. On uh, February 21, like the Earth is here, so the Sun is projected to the Aquarius. And that's how the uh, orbit of the Earth around the Sun uh, uh, creates the various zodia we know about. Also, this is uh, interesting. The, as we said, the axis of the Earth to the equatorial plane cuts into an angle, is not perpendicular, it is in an angle. And that um, gives the opportunity for the North Hemisphere, which is here summer, winter time, to be closer to the sun. So we have, uh, say, uh, better winters than the South Hemisphere, which is here, okay? When we have summer, the South Hemisphere has winter is away from the sun. In summertime, we are away from the sun, but the sun comes, uh, the light rays from the sun come into more perpendicular way to the surface of the earth. Okay, over here, winter, they come into an angle. That's the reason we have winter. Now the time, we have uh, various ways to measure the time. Is the sidereal time that is defined by the our angle of the vernal of work with Knox. And then we have the solar time with all these uh, ways, different uh, ways to uh, measure it. Uh, the reason we have all these different ways is because, as we said, because the sun doesn't move with the same spin all the time. It has uh, different uh, spins. And uh, as we said, the, the earth around the sun has different speeds, it doesn't have the same speed. But the clocks we use they, they have the, the same uh, speed. So in order to uh, balance this difference, what we do is we put a fictitious sun on the equator that um, moves with the constant speed. Okay, and we call it mean solar time. Okay, and that's how comes the universal time coordinate or universal time in here. But uh, the true solar time is uh, 
based on the apparent motion of the sun. And therefore the difference between the true solar time and the fictitious sun we put to adjust our clocks, okay? It's called the equation of time. Now, in order also to uh, work in an area like a country or a wided area with the same clock time, we have the zones around the earth that, that they have each zone has a constant time. And here are the zones around the earth. They start from the Greenwich zone. For instance, Greece has two hours difference and the Eastern United States, they have, I think, five hour difference. Okay. You can so see that. Okay. Now the time uh, works uh, in order to be able to keep it somehow constant. Uh, we have to have some somewhere a reference clock working and doing that, and this is a uh, an atomic time with the Cesium 133 that does that. And uh, also the sidereal time, which is the uh, our angle of, of gamma. Uh, the gamma is uh, a fixed point uh, on the celestial sphere. So in one year has uh, 24 hours about difference with the solar time because the, the sun also moves uh, around the ecliptic, okay? And uh, also we have as a reference time for the solar system, the sidereal time. And uh, there are links uh, in the internet uh, calculators that uh, if you use your, um, uh, you put there your longitude, they give you all this uh, sidereal time and uh, whatever else you want to, to calculate. We said about the axis of the earth that is not, uh, uh, does not uh, maintain a constant uh, uh, direction, okay? It has the so-called precession and mutation. This is precession and mutation. And this is, there are very small movements, but we need to do the corrections. And as I said, there are tables that gives us the corrections for a particular time period. Now, we have different uh, ways now to use the time from, uh, go for instance, from the local uh, mean time, that whatever the, uh, our clocks uh, show, to go and calculate the local sidereal time or uh, the right access, the local um, uh, star uh, time, etc., and also do some other calculations like if we want to determine this way the long, long, longitude and the latitude on the location on the Earth and the azimuth. We can do also calculations like that with the time. The Mean uh, sun, we said is a fictitious sun created by uniform stellar motion at the equator and the clocks are sy synchronized with it. The difference between the real sun and the fictitious sun is the equation of time. Of course, we have to understand that the real sun, uh, our, the, the time, starts from noon at noon, 12 uh, at noon, and the, the, the time we measure on the clocks, they start from midnight. So they have a 12 hours difference that we have to take into consideration also. And the universal uh, time coordinated, okay, is the time, the Greenwich uh, time. Now over here is the equation of time that is given from uh, day zero to 365, okay, through the year. You see the minimum uh, is minus, how to say 15 minutes and the maximum is about 18 minutes, as you can see here in this diagram. 
Over here also is given the, say the, the Greenwich Meridian is this one, and this one is a location on the Earth with uh, 90 degrees longitude. And in this way, you can see what we call local apparent time. This is the apparent sun, this is the mean sun. Okay, this is the local mean time. The, and we have the Greenwich uh, mean time and the Greenwich uh, uh, apparent time. Okay, the Greenwich mean time is this one. This is the Greenwich apparent time. If we want to calculate the hour angle of uh, the local hour angle of the star, probably if we want to observe a star, okay, then we can uh, use the local time you see here to transfer to the Greenwich uh, time, and this is the, the this is the time zone, and this is the daylight savings time. This is summer time, and this is the right ascension of the star, 12 hours difference. We said this is the equation of time if we use the, the sun. This is the longitude of the place and the right ascension of the star we want to calculate the hour angle. And uh, this is how we do it with this formula. Of course, there are calculators, they do it for us. Okay, just you put the longitude here and the time. Okay, and then it gives you all these values we said earlier. Right, right, a session. This is for the sun, Julian date, uh, mean sidereal time, you can see here. Equation of time. Okay, it gives you all the values automatically. This is the internet address. Now, if you are in a location, you don't have GPS, you have nothing, you want to get your orientation in North Hemisphere, this is the Polaris. You can find it from the Ursa Major, it looks like a pot, okay, in the kitchen, kitchen pot. And you project these two stars, you project it and you get a, an alone, a star alone. And the location is the North Star or Polaris. And this is also on the right, Cassiope. The other stars of the Usa Minor, they don't appear to be too bright, but the Polaris is brighter than all of this and around this neighborhood. We can measure the measurements and calculations. Actually, the measurements we do is we measure, we measure, measure with the theodolite the altitude of the star and the azimuth and the time. These three things is what we measure. And then we can do calculations using the so-called PCS triangle. This is the pole, the zenith of the place, and this is the celestial body. And uh, solving this triangle, we can determine like the longitude, latitude, azimuth, and whatever else we want to, to measure here. This is from spherical trigonometry, how we solve the spherical triangle. Actually, we have with small letters the arcs and with the large letters the angles. Okay. And this is another more complicated way to find out where is the, the PGS triangle. Okay, this is the uh, celestial pole, North Pole. This is the zenith of this location on the Earth, okay? And this is the prime meridian that passes through the pole and the zenith. This is the prime meridian of this location here. Actually, any celestial body crossing this, uh, uh, so this observer's uh, prime meridian, okay? Then uh, this uh, celestial body is in culmination is in the highest altitude above the horizon. And uh, over here, usually 
we measure as 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 I said. Okay, you you can see this is the observer's horizon. So the star above the horizon, this one is the altitude of the star. Okay, and uh, then uh, we have the time is related to this our angle of this star with the with the time when we record the time at the moment of the observation we can calculate this t angle here and then if we know the altitude the uh, also uh, we know the declination of the star we said that this is known from the tables okay the astronomical ephemerides they are called and uh, if if we we can calculate the latitude or the longitude if we know all this uh, we do all these measurements of course there are other measurements that we measure one or more stars at the moment of culmination etc that uh, simplifies things or we make observations on the sun and the polaris to get our location on the earth but we are not going to go into more detail on that Okay, this is how we calculate the azimuth by observations on the Polaris. And what we measure actually here is only the altitude of the, of the, actually we measure the time, we measure the observation and the alt, altitude of the Polaris. Also, what we calculate if we calculate the long, longitude, the latitude of a place, this is the astronomical longitude, latitude, which do not have much difference with the geodetic or uh, geographic uh, latitude, uh, longitude here. Okay, the difference the geographic is uh, on the surface on the Earth, the other are on the celestial sphere. And on the surface of the Earth, we have different other considerations like the ellipsoidal parameters of the shape of the Earth. Or if we go into projections, we have the projection parameters. This is the way we can measure the, uh, when we do observations on the Polaris, how we can calculate the azimuth, precisely the astronomical azimuth on the Earth. And this is the end of the lecture in the astronomy. Just I put this transparency because last uh, time we had the question about regarding uh, we are sure that virtue with the internal and external balance can be taught and make a difference to young fellows. And I give this example. How come, like the media, they convince these young uh, fellows that uh, having this uh, situation in their pants, they are beautiful. They have the sense of the beautiful. And uh, of course, it, it is much easier to convince them that they will have quality in life if they follow the internal and external balance. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I have something to say practically. Uh, I will refer to the horizon, the azimuth, which is the, the right angle formed between the north and the uh, point uh, intended by the compass, i.e. a practical means that we use for our orientation. To achieve this, we, we turn the, the pointer in the direction of the point we, we want to determine the location. Of course, in the place with the magnetic fields, it is not accurate. As in America, for example, while in, in Greece, there is no magnetic field to be affected. We turn the uh, windshield of the compass so that the magnetic need, needle coincides uh, with the north 
of the windshield and uh, we read on the windshield the indication in degrees given to us by the base of the pointer uh, the windmill has the the cycle and uh, the circumference of 360 degrees in four equal points of uh, 90 degrees which is zero and always coincides the the north with the uh, 360 uh, degrees that is the uh, tramundana the opposite point of the south of the uh, 180 degrees is the austria on the right and the in the middle between the north and the south in the 90 uh, is Le levantes or it is called the uh, apilotis also another line called zephyros the four lines that determine the direction of the of the winds based on the windmill and this is the practical method for azimuth now recording the terrestrial reference system the aqueta uh, which is the the greatest imaginary cycle and we can bring it around the earth and the parallels of the uh, latitude that are above and below it elite <coughs> and are infin infinite for its place there is a parallel only uh, in other words such imaginary cycles we can bring myriads and as you you said they are the meridians uh, we observe that all these uh, meridians necessarily pass through the point p and p uh, on the thing you uh, you have shown us, that is, uh, from the north and south, and the meridians necessarily pass from that from there. Its distance from the parallels show that the same with F to show that this is the the cycle of latitude, while the distance of the imaginary line is same L uh, is the longitude. And now we go to the celestial dome. Uh, can you show us the celestial dome, Professor? Did you, did you find? No, no. Okay. That's the same. Okay. And the zodiac, the zodiacs, the months. Yeah. Anyhow, we, we, we keep in our mind the shape of uh, the months. Uh, if you can find it now, I continue. This is the uh, slide. Anyhow, anyhow. This is, this is it. Okay. okay. Uh, as, I, as I said, in the annual motion, of the earth uh, where you presented us the the months of the zodiac science mm -hmm. besides these there are other constellations that we use for our orientation especially when we meet at night with the pole star we can find where the north 
is, and, uh, and then we find easily south, east, and west. Based on the big bear, uh, which uh, has the Al Gore, second in line, the one that astrologers uh, observed at, and tasted the uh, argument of their vision. That's why it is called a tester. The little bear, the uh, Arcturus, as we call, uh, Hercules, Pegasus, uh, fed on flames and much more. Uh, this is a cyclopedia now uh, knowledge uh, and Kashopi, which has a great role in our orientation. The great constellation of the dog has the glittering Sirius on its left, Arion, which rises in the autumn and midwinter and sets in spring. And in the fantastic square between uh, uh, that imagined square, the three kings who represent the three Christmas ma magicians. That's all, thank you. Thank you, coordinator. And I think we must give the floor to Helen to... Uh, uh, very interesting comments <laughs> from the coordinator. May I, may I ask a question? Yes. Yes. I, yes. I have a question about, um, you know, the, all of this is very complex um, information, but you, you use the word time many times. And I have a question about time. It's probably a simplistic question, but I would like your feedback. So, in the calculation of time, when we, as we calculate time, uh, is it dependent on the distance from the sun, on speed, uh, uh, movement, the speed of movement, or any other factors? Or is, it, is, is time a concept which is static? I mean, can you, can you shed some light on uh, what chronos, what time is? Yes. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I, actually, what uh, we uh, define as time is something that uh, is related to our problems and how we our, to, to cover our needs. And uh, to cover our needs uh, is the clock time that uh, considers that the sun goes or oh, is on the equator and goes on the same speed uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in 24 hours uh, makes a full rotation around the earth from east uh, to west again against to, to so, okay. so time what you what you're saying is time the way we calculate time is simply a convenient way for human beings that's right to describe their own activities. That's right. Then we have time that we need in the scientific uh, area that we have to see uh, the stars, the sun, how they were thousands of years ago and how they are today and what changes we have. So that uh, the time is, and we have all this GPS and all these things. So, uh, GPS has its own time also, how it starts and how it functions. But uh, scientifically, we have the so-called Julian day, which starts uh, zero something, I think. I, I think somewhere in the transparencies I mentioned that some um, a few thousand years ago. Starts and it's up to date, the Julian date. Then we have the real time, the universe time that probably started when the Big Bang took place. Okay, and uh, probably this is the, the best time because in the last, next uh, lecture, I'm going to talk uh, about that. Okay. 
when this uh, happens, you know, then the ether starts uh, uh, moving in a spiral way and uh, for uh, creating this uh, movement, the wave, the wave moving, uh, say, particles create uh, this time. But uh, also we have a, a, a clock to, uh, to measure the time. So we don't lose it. Okay, and this is uh, the atomic clocks I told you that uh, they have uh, uh, this uh, standard frequency. They, usually we started with the crystals like the quartz, so most of the clocks they have, okay? And uh, because they have a constant frequency but it's not exactly constant. Mm -hmm. So the atomic clock has more than less constant frequency. That's the reason they use it to, to have it as a reference. So we don't lose uh, seconds or fra fraction of seconds through the years. Okay, it's, a, it's not a simple thing, as you see. <laughs> it's really complicated. Very much so. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Am I next? <laughs> yes, you are. Okay. And uh, thank you, the uh, coordinator, because you complimentary, you know, help uh, my lecture. Okay, so share my screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you see my uh, yes, presentation? Yes. Is my presentation uh, visible to everybody? Yes. Yes, Thank you. Is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, it's difficult to uh, for me to make a transition from uh, Professor Hadzopoulos' um, summary overview of uh, of of time, of geopositioning, of of the very complex matters that he discusses, to uh, Tolstoy's the three questions. It seems on the surface that we are going from something very complicated to something very simple, but I I I'm not sure about that. Not sure about anything anymore especially since um, we've started uh, including Plato and Aristotle into the equation, uh, who, by the way, Tolstoy was an avid um, reader of, as well as Rousseau, as well as many philosophers. Uh, so the three questions, I hope you had a chance to read the short story before class today. Um, it was um, published as part of part of what Tolstoy wrote in the last part of his life. His great novels, War and Peace, Anna Karenina, etc., were written in the first part of his life. But um, he, as he as he grew older, there came a time when he rejected. I would say rejected many of the preconceptions that he lived under for most of his life. Uh, and he wrote many short stories and essays that reflected a, a, a turn to the simple. He was very interested in education. That's a, a very important part of Tolstoy. Very interested in, in bringing the great ideas down to a simpler level for the, as he called the common man, the peasant, uh, those who are not intellectually uh, stimulated, let's say, those who don't necessarily go to the university and study Jean-Paul Sartre, et cetera, existentialism and all of the rest. But he, was, he, he felt that in the simple stories that he wrote, 
uh, that the greater universal truths could be found. So I, I can stop there as we get into this. So that's uh, a, a Tolstoy. Who was Tolstoy? Uh, Tolstoy was a, no, a Russian nobleman born into a very aristocratic family. He led a, uh, his younger years, his youthful life was, was spent in enjoyment and dissolution. He traveled to Europe. Uh, he came back and I think a, 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 most people will agree that a great turning point in his life was his service in the Crimean War. Uh, a particularly violent, horrible episode in the history of Russia when uh, uh, Russia was attacked by the great powers at the time, including the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it was a long war, it was vicious. Uh, Tolstoy uh, saw battle and when he came back, he was, he was changed. Uh, he, he got married, uh, a great love affair between himself and Sophia and uh, produced, I believe it was 13 children over the years. He had 13 children, eight of whom survived childhood. Uh, established a great, uh, a great family. Uh, unfortunately, some of his property was sold off uh, to pay gambling debts. Um, he was a, a very well-rounded figure. He, he was interested in philosophy. He was interested in the daily pleasures of life. Uh, and he was interested also in his immortality, I think, as the years went by. We can say that for most people, I would say. Let's go to the, uh, the, three, the three questions. Uh, and I think that they're one of the um, key factors that uh, Tolstoy was interested in, in terms of his life, in terms of his work, were the unknowns. And I found this quote, I think it, it describes Tolstoy very well. Uh, someone once said, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are also unknown unknowns. We all understand that. And uh -huh. then Tol Tolstoy would have added this. He would have said that there are unknown knowns. A uh, very metaphysical, very metaphysical statement, but he was a metaphysical man in his writings. And I have a few examples here uh, for, for the class, uh, for anybody who's watching, example of known knowns, recorded documents, dates, artifacts, we can only observe, uh, but we can only observe them uh, in the past. Examples of known unknowns, myriad. Here is where inquiry, for example, in your field, Dr. Hazopoulos, uh, science, uh, the, the whole espionage field makes its attempts. And then the unknown knowns would be where Tolstoy, I think, is trying to, uh, trying to, uh, trying to find out, trying to understand what we mean by that, just as Plato and Aristotle and the great Greek philosophers were doing 2,500 years before him. So what is the conflict in the three questions? The conflict arises because the experts, the czar first consults, cannot fathom that we can only observe the past and that randomness rules the past, thus making future activity impossible to determine. So the past and the future are impossible to uh, determine. They're not living as a community, are divided into too many factions, have preconceived notions about the workings of the world, are too overconfident about their igno ignorance using their time on earth for self-promotion. Unlike the czar, they are not on the path to self-transcendence. Now we're talking about the experts, 
the people that he first consulted, the czar. They're not on the path of self-transcendence, not even receptive to each other. Instead of imparting wisdom, or at least knowledge to the king, they highlight their confusion about life, self-contradictory, not self-reflective, ignorant in the matter of the utmost importance, how to be a good human being in life. Now, of course, the czar did not ask the wise, he did not ask the learned men how to be a good human. He had specific questions about, uh, he had specific questions about um, the, uh, that he asked. And, and here are the questions. When is the right time for every action? Who are the right people to listen to? And what is the most important thing to do? So he was convinced that if he would succeed in any endeavor, if he possessed the answers to these three questions. So in order to do that, he asked the advice from the most educated in his kingdom. After hearing the answers, the king decided he would approach a hermit widely known for his wisdom. And I think we, we know what a hermit is, but just to, just to recapitulate, uh, recapitulate the definition of a hermit, in, the, in terms of the, uh, in the context of Russian society, and many other societies as well. Uh, a hermit is a man usually, but there are also women, uh, men who live away from the social uh, interactions of communities, live close to nature and commune with God. Uh, many nations, many countries have uh, their own uh, versions of hermits. Uh, Native Americans, uh, Asian Indian, the gurus, et cetera, although the gurus have uh, end up having followers. Uh, in fact, some of the hermits in, in uh, Russian times also have their followers after they've established uh, monasteries, et cetera. Anyways, not to get off the point. So in order to approach the hermit, which is interesting, the king dressed in plain clothes, he dismissed his bodyguards, and he met the wise man alone. Uh, this tells us something, I think, about the king. The king already has uh, a, a very important, he, he already has an understanding of his place, of his position in terms of the, of the hermit. He's not going to the hermit dressed in his royal finery with all of his soldiers and all of his followers. But he is, uh, he is either, either uh, I think cleverly, possibly, cleverly doing so in order to be able to approach the hermit. He, he has a sense of submissiveness. He has a sense of his unworthiness as a human being. He's not possessed of this uh, of, of some kind of a royal uh, of, of importance. So that's important to note, I think. Let's continue. I'm just going to go a little bit faster. Um, uh, th th there are three quotes uh, from, the, from the story. Uh, so the first, uh, the first lesson, I would say, the episode, uh, treat others how you want to be treated. And in the text, the example is, you are tired, let me take the spade and work a while for you. Uh, can anybody in the class tell me who said that? Who yes. said you are tired? Yes, said that. the king said that, exactly. The king said to the Kermit. To the hermit. Kermit. Okay, the second episode, live in the moment not in the past or future. The example in the text, when the man ran into us, the most important time was when you were attending him. If you had not bound up his wounds, he would have died without making peace with you. Without making peace with you. Who said that? 
Anybody? Uh, the wounded man said that. The hermit said that. The hermit said that. You were sent here to do good for the world. Yeah. Example, the most important thing to do is to do good. Who said that? Uh, the hermit. The hermit again. Okay. Very good class. I'm glad you read the short story. Um, a little bit, just a little bit also about uh, the way that Tolstoy uh, writes the story. His characters are both dynamic and static. The hermit is a dynamic character in one sense. Uh, he stays true to his beliefs throughout the story. Now, some people say that, well, if, if he doesn't change, if the hermit is not changing, how is that dynamic? Uh, maybe we can talk about that in a, in a short time. The czar, the emperor, the king, is both, is both dynamic and static. He wants the answers to receive enlightenment. The hermit helps the czar realize the answers, thus saving a wounded man. He is also static because the three questions he poses prevents him from realizing that he was living by the answers without knowing the answers. So uh, he's actually ecstatic because he is innately, innately he, uh, the, the qualities that he is seeking, he already possesses, but unknowingly, he doesn't know that he has these qualities. Uh, the also the uh, the the assassin, the wounded man, is also a uh, uh, is also a a, uh, a dynamic uh, character. I think I think a purely dynamic character. Um, I was sent to kill you, and you saved my life. Well, we we know that uh, the assassin had reasons for trying to kill the king. The king had killed the assassin's brother and taken all of his property. Uh, the assassin was very angry. He was seeking revenge. Uh, and yet uh, by uh, the king attending to him and saving his life, uh, he changes. So in that sense, he is a, 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 uh, he is a dynamic character. He changes. But can anybody tell me before we go on now, why do you feel, why do we say that the hermit is a dynamic character instead of static? Perhaps because uh, he didn't give the answers, the answers the first time to the king. Mm -hmm. And then it's after the wizard came, then he gave the answers. Wonderful. He left. He Wonderful. Left. He left, he left to come the, the right time. He left it to, to, to answer when the right time came. This is wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, I, it, it, yes, absolutely. He is dynamic because he doesn't follow the, the rules of discourse, let's say. He doesn't answer a question when the question is asked, but he does something maybe Socrates would do. He would, or any of the Greek philosophers, he would, uh, he would be patient and he would give examples. He would give uh, parables. He would ask other questions. Or in the case of the hermit, he would be silent and wait and see what the king would do. Uh, that takes a lot of energy. <laughs> And so we say that uh, we can say very, very easily uh, that the hermit is a dynamic character. Okay, let me go further a little bit. Um, I think uh, because maybe because of time, uh, because all of the, the slides here are self-descriptive, 
uh, and uh, we can talk about them. But because of time, I think we should go to our, our final um, homework slide at this point. We haven't really talked about the relationship between uh, the Greek philosophers and Tolstoy or the hermit and the king and the characters, but we can do so now. We've had enough background in the last eight lessons that we can, uh, we can talk about it a little bit better. Thank you, uh, Professor Hazopoulos, for sending your homework ahead of time. And for anybody who's listening on Facebook, any students, uh, I would request that for next week, please send your ideas uh, beforehand if possible. Okay, so let's take a look at the czar. Uh, I changed uh, this because I, I, I think it's important to take into consideration what the class members say. Um, you have, uh, you, 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 uh, Div di divided the czar uh, into before and after. Now, I, I wouldn't have done that, but I think it's very clever and it's very insightful what you have done. Uh, the czar before, you say, Dr. Hazopoulos, is confused and, and is not internally balanced. I, I'm not sure why you say he's confused. I think you're saying he's confused because he is asking so many people uh, uh, for the answers to his questions. He's not able to self-reflect at this time. Is that what you mean by confused? Yes, he does not uh, know the answers to his questions. But he... He, he doesn't know or he is not aware that he doesn't know. Um, either way, is, uh, that, that's the confusion. Okay, all right. But you see, the, 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 the problem that I have with that, and I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm not disagreeing with you, but the problem that I have with uh, the word, maybe it's the word confused, is that um, how, how does Plato, how does Plato uh, understand self, self actualization or self realization? I mean, I remember the allegory of the cave. It, it seems to me that uh, it's, it's impossible, impossible for some people to ever come to uh, an understanding of reality or understanding reality, outward reality without understanding their own reality themselves, within themselves. Um, but I don't consider that to be confusing, but maybe we're just using, playing with words. It's okay. I'm not, we're not, we don't have to get, uh, we don't have to um, uh, worry about that. Um, okay. After the meeting with the hermit, the czar has internal balance and he, has, he, he finds internal balance by seeking answers. So in the, in the search for answers, he becomes balanced. Yes, because uh, he used his uh, logic to balance the desire and anger there. Oh, now I understand. Oh now I use his logic, then he is in balance. Now I understand. By by not uh, by not listening to all of these learned wise men, uh, he has an internal logic, which tells him that he needs to continue his search for the answers. Yeah, I see. Does he I have see. Answers? He I see without uh, answers before that. Okay, now, Aristotle, he's out of balance, he's created enemies. And we know that because of the, uh, the assassin. No, we are talking about actions. When we we're go to Aristotle, we, when we, we talk about uh, 
uh, efficient logic. And when we go to Aristotle, we are talking about actions. We're talking That's about right. actions. Yeah, he, the, Mm -hmm. Actions so, are balance because creating enemies. Yes, that's a good way. Creating enemies, exactly, would be uh, a a uh, a, uh, a, uh, a uh, creating enemies would be a sign of a being out of balance. Uh, exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, and the consequences, of course, victims, because of that, enemies threatening his life. And, uh, and then you have another comment also, never too late to become a virtuous person. Exactly. Okay. Afterwards, and he's sought the answers. He has external balance by acting to find answers. Um, and... You know, I have I, I have a question as well for anybody uh, here, anybody here in the class. Uh, what does um, what does the czar do, the king? What does the king do, though? To how does he find the answers? How is it that he finds the answers? Does he find the answers uh, by his own initiative? by his own reasoning, by his own logic, or does he come to the realization because the hermit teaches him, tells him what he needs to know? I find, I find this a little bit difficult to understand uh, when I'm, I mean, I understand the story, but I, I find it a little bit difficult to understand uh, this part of your, your answer. It, it's very simple to me because everything starts from the efficient logic again. The efficient logic says that something goes wrong in your kingdom. You have to something you are doing wrong. Mm -hmm. You have to find the ways to correct it. And he raises these three questions. Then with his logic, uh, the moment he sees that the, all these uh, around him advisors, they, they do not satisfy, uh, they do not give satisfying answers, he goes to the hermit. So he tries to find uh, the best, uh, the optimum way to get the answers. And he tries, everything he has <coughs> and uh, the, the best uh, uh, thing is to to go to the hermit and uh, when he finds the answers there then he changes his actions because aristotle's actions and he get, does both he has internal balance and external balance because he corrects his errors the, the degree he could correct it uh, may, may, you may I, yes, may I, please, please. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> the answers were not give were were not given by the king, but mm -hmm. the the hermit gave the the answer. Uh, 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 up the time that the the king was waiting the answers, mm -hmm. uh, the the hermit explain to to the king what was the right time for each question and then the uh, king understood what uh, the three questions uh, were so i can say that uh, the the three questions were given by the hermit uh, to the king and uh, the king understood understood the meaning and then we find the external uh, balance of Aristotle. So I, I think I, that's my opinion. Yes, uh, that's wonderful. Absolutely. I think what you're saying is there, there's a symbiosis between uh, the activity, the actions of the king in following what, the, no, he, he's not following what the hermit is telling him to do. He is doing it of his own will, of his own free will, of his own volition. 
uh, in terms of the, uh, the end though, uh, the realization of what the, answer, of what the answers to his questions are, he's still not sure until the hermit tells him, but he, he realizes that through his actions, he knows the answers, uh, which, is, which leads me to my final point. Uh, how is that, uh, how can we, how can this, um, this short story and this uh, relationship between the hermit and the king be used in uh, reforming education? Since I, I know this is one of the purposes of the course, uh, can we discuss this now or another yeah. time? Yes, well, there never is too late. To become a virtuous person covers that because the moment someone understands the, each, uh, the mistakes that does, okay, then from there on has to uh, have efficient logic to hide a way how to correct the mistakes. And this is the all the idea of internal balance, to have efficient logic when something goes wrong to see how to correct it. And this is what the king does. And this is uh, how the, he uh, got the, the optimum, I would say, way through the hermit to get these answers and find his way and correct his uh, errors. This is education, internal balance, efficient logic. And then if you uh, see your mistakes, your bad things, you you can start uh, uh, correcting them and do the external balance. I'm still, I, 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 I understand what you're saying and I agree with you. However, pragmatically speaking, uh, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure that the real world that we live in uh, is filled with people who are willing to learn like the king and people like the hermit who are wise enough uh, to be able to, to allow the, the student uh, uh, the knowledge. So th this, is, uh, this is where I'm, I'm um, trying to understand uh, how, do we, how do we bring this situation here from the, the three questions into our classrooms today? Uh, can, uh, but, but we can... Um, let me uh, continue here. I had one, one more. Maybe I, I can't. I think uh, it's difficult to find it because my slide is too big. Let me make it smaller if I can. I had one more question and then maybe I can't. I had a question about the other characters, but that's okay. I, I can't, uh, I'm not able to, maybe I can, no, I can't do it, that's okay. Well, that's that's all I have. I, I wanted to, to ask a question about the, um, uh, the uh, learned men, the people that the czar first um, sought out for um, answers and how you would place them into this chart. That's what I was hoping to do here, but I can't find my, I can't find my uh, learned men here. I think I can find them now. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. Okay. The learned men. Because we know our, our world today, our world today is, is governed by these experts. We have so many experts uh, advising us, advising our leaders what to do. Uh, I think they're out of balance. I think ev everything about these people is out of balance, personally. Yeah, well, the, the world today is governed by the markets. <laughs> it's uh, out of the human uh, 
the, the governance of this world is not uh, taking into account the human beings, it's the markets. That's what it is. They tell us officially. So, we, so, so uh, what can we say? Let's cancel cancel these people out. We'll just cancel them out because they don't they don't exist in this ideal such ideal world. They 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 cannot uh, they 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 are they're living in another. They're existing uh, for other purposes. For as you said, the market. Yeah, that's right. That's what they say all the time. And uh, we have, as humans, if we have free will, if we have sufficient logic to see this thing and try to correct it. So the education system, which operates in at the market level, it certainly operates with um, under the under the control of the market. How do we change that? With this effort, we do in this class. Okay. That's what I thought you would say. This is the way. This, no this, is the, way. this is the meaning of the lectures to find the way how mm -hmm. to to go through and uh, know the 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 uh, the philosophy the philosophy uh, as it appears wise to solve our problems. Well, I have uh, I have nothing else to say at this point. Yes. I'm, I, I, I'm... Have so, I have something to say. Good. <laughs> uh, well, uh, for me, the right moment that pro proves the internal balance of virtue was the uh, disguise of the king to have the answer from the hermit. The second is the willing is the the willingness of the helmet to rest in digging an internal balance the fact that the the helmet did not give the answer and waited at the right time at that right moment this shows the the external balance of virtue because uh, it would be understood by the king in practice in in the right moment the, the the answers will be given at the right time and will be understood by the the king. So, having the internal balance, the king treated his enemy with the result that the the wounded man felt the the trans constance of goodness and his friendship friendship was accepted by the king and by enemies to become companions in in their lives later so uh, this is a, a, an internal balance really because enemies uh, and king became friends and not only friends but the king took the uh, his enemy uh, to his uh, 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 say to his house anyhow, and uh, live with him. It means that the, the mm. internal balance worked uh, normally and logically. That's all. Thank you. Uh, may I ask you quickly what uh, what you have a com you had a comment about the assassin, the wounded man. What did you say about him? Hey, I nice. missed him. Yeah, it was before the it was wounded and after. Before he was out of balance internal to go, you know, through revenge and kill the king and uh, out of external balance, also trying to act uh, like that. And uh, the consequence was to be wounded. But uh, after the, he was treated by the king, he did uh, have efficient logic to understand that mm -hmm. the king saved his life. So he is not bad to kill him. So, and uh, he turned out to be, uh, 
to help the king, whatever he could uh, service he could, uh, uh, he was able to do. And he was a friend. He exhibit, uh, I mean, that's a quality of pride that he had. Uh, what is the, uh, the mid space? What is the mid space of pride? I know there's extremes, there's pride, there's humility. And I think at, at, uh, at so he at, at first he is the, the wounded man is is filled with pride, which is a negative. He's out of balance because of his pride. So he regains his he you would say he regains his what his humility. Uh, uh, efficient logic. Efficient logic. Okay. Yeah. And then. Under Aristotle, it would be he he regains. He, a he became a friend of King under Aristotle. Yeah, right, e exactly. Good. Okay, but, thank you. Okay. I, I want thank you so much. I wanted to clarify that. Thank you so much to both of you, to everybody, for the uh, inter inter exchange, and I will send the um, revised PowerPoint to all. Thank you. Uh, I also want to thank you, Helen, because you were wonderful in all the aspects of the laboratory coordination. And also Dimitris uh, was excellent in his job. Uh, and I want to listen to Petros, and I don't see him. Petros has left, has left. Petros has left. But oh. I, 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 want, I want to congratulate Helen because she prepared the uh, laboratory so so well and the whole story she explained she made she made the questions to us mm -hmm. she wanted to uh, dip to the to the uh, story and uh, this is a, a very very uh, a good thing because we try to find the truth to find the logic and uh, philosophy in logical way Thank you very much. I think uh, we were we, very kind. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Professor, do you have anything to close? Yes, uh, I think it was an excellent discussion today, and I agree with you, Dimitris, about Helen. She's excellent, really, in her job. It's today. very difficult uh, for me. It's very exciting. Uh, and uh, full of possibilities, but what is hard for me to, under to, to understand and to design is the connections between the philosophers and the literature. But I can say this, Professor Fadzopoulos and uh, Mr. Vogelis, I have to tell you that it's becoming easier. And anybody uh, out there on Facebook, wherever, who is um, watching this or listening, um, I think you can gain a great deal of knowledge, just as I have. I have learned so much uh, from being part of the series. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You, have, you have made the, an, an excellent work. So we thank you very, very much. You're very and kind. Now, and now I say good night to everybody and meet again next Saturday. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.